Okay, so in this video, we're going to show that to be Cauchy and to be convergent are actually the same thing for our purposes. So like I was saying, a lot of the reason we're interested in this is just because of the utility of the Cauchy criterion as uh, a way to analyze sequences whose limits are not readily described. Um, okay, so the first thing we wanna do is show that a convergent sequence is also Cauchy. This is sort of the easy direction here because if you know it converges and if you sort of have access to the limiting value, then it's easy to control the behavior of the sequence and show that it would be Cauchy. It's difficult going the other way because you don't know what the limit is and it's hard to describe uh, what that would be. So, okay, let's do this. So um, this is theorem uh, or lemma, sorry, 10.9. Convergent sequences are Cauchy. Okay, so uh, let Sn be a sequence which converges to a number s. Now the idea here is just that if Sn and Sm are close to s, then they are close to each other, right? So uh, let epsilon be greater than zero, right? The question though is like, how close are they, right? If we know how close Sn and Sm are to S, how does that translate into our idea of how close they actually are to each other, right? And basically it would just be that, you know, if they, if the, their errors, you know, if the distance from S of each of these were kind of in opposite directions, then they get added together, right? So worst case, the distance is the sum of distances to S, okay? Uh, so what we want to do is basically make each of those individual distances to S be less than epsilon over two. This is, so people actually sometimes call this the epsilon over two trick. I mean, we've already kind of seen this, but um, yeah, uh, it's a, it's a very common thing to do. So, um, so there exists a capital N such that um, for all N greater than capital N, uh, we have Sn minus S is less than epsilon over two. So now let little m and little n be bigger than capital N, okay? Then the triangle inequality tells us that Sn minus Sm, which is equal to Sn minus S plus S minus Sm, uh, is less than or equal to the sum, oh, whoops, that's not what I want, Sn minus S plus Sm minus S, uh, which is less than or equal to epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, which equals epsilon, right? Or rather, sorry, this one here is strict. So, um, yeah, so we just showed that for this value of capital N, uh, we know that any two terms in the sequence after that value of capital N have to be within epsilon away of each other. So uh, Sn is Cauchy. Okay, so that's that. Um, now to approach the other direction, the general strategy the very broad strategy here is to show that Cauchy sequences converge because their limb sup and their limb inf agree. So remember that uh, we showed that when the limit superior and limit inferior are the same number, then a sequence has to converge. And this is actually another um, case of kind of a, a fact that we have at our disposal that lets us tell, tell when a sequence converges without really knowing the value. Um, 
of the limit, right? So uh, the first key thing to do is show that um, Cauchy sequences are bounded. This is actually another lemma. So this is lemma 10.10. .10. Yeah. Right, and so we do this uh, in a manner very similar to how we showed that convergent sequences are bounded which is basically just sort of picking an arbitrary uh, tolerance to get all the terms in the sequence to be close to each other and then uh, dealing with like the first n terms of the sequence separately. So um, let Sn be Cauchy. Then there exists a capital N such that um, S n minus s m is less than one, right? So remember when we showed that convergent sequences are bounded, we chose epsilon equals one and then invoked the definition. We're doing the same thing again here. This is for all n and m bigger than capital N. Um, so uh, then now what we want to do is we want to make sure that, so we want to try to use this to bound all of these things above, right? And uh, it's a little bit, you know, maybe it's not super obvious at first because uh, before what we did was we, we used this to bound Sn above by, um, or bound the absolute value of Sn by the absolute value of the limit plus one. But now we can't really just, so we can't say Sn is just less than or equal to Sm plus one because of this pesky M here this is a variable, right? They're sort of, yeah, it's a variable, quote unquote, right? Uh, so this isn't really a consistent upper bound on the absolute values of Sn, but actually we're making things too hard on ourselves by thinking about it like that, because what we can do, if this is true for any pair, we can just fix M to be a specific value. So we can, um, we can just choose, you know, capital N plus one, let's say. So then, Sn minus S capital N plus one is less than or equal to Eps, or sorry, uh, one, or is, is less than one for all little n. So we just fixed M to be at N plus one. Uh, so by the same logic we saw before in the uh, convert one for conversion sequences, this means that um, Sn is less than, let's say, yeah, less than um, Sn plus one plus one, right? For all n greater than n. So uh, this actually gives us a real upper bound on all of these Sn's. And then we just have to deal with the first capital N terms uh, separately, right? So, um, to do that, we just say, so then take, let's say M to be the maximum of S1, S2, and so on, and then Sn, and then Sn plus one, plus one, uh, then it's clear that, um, Sn is less than or equal to m for all n. Okay, so that shows that uh, Cauchy sequences are bounded. Okay, so I think now we're actually ready for the final theorem here, 
and this is the last theorem in this chapter. So this will be the end of the lecture. So this is theorem um, 10.11. A sequence is Cauchy if and only if it converges. So we already did half of this, right? Um, so I guess the backwards direction convergence implying Cauchy, um, that was lemma 10.9. Yes. So now let's do the forward direction, right? So they just stated it this way to kind of have a nice, you know, make a nice statement that summarizes everything we did, but we did already basically do half of the proof here. So, uh, now let's do the other way. So the strategy, remember, is to show that the lim sup and the lim inf are equal, right? So in this case, the way this works is basically it's a similar technique to what we saw before with the s plus epsilon thing. So what we do is, let's see. All right, sorry, I just had to make a little edit because I had to go back and uh, refer to the notes here. But yeah, so here's the, here's the technique, right? So what we wanna do is um, show that the limit superior of SN is less than or equal to the limit inferior Sn plus epsilon for all epsilon greater than zero. Remember, this is the same technique that we saw before where um, to show that two numbers are equal, you actually show that one of them is less than or equal to the other one plus an arbitrary other number, right? An arbitrary positive number. Uh, and that actually implies, so this means they are equal. Okay, so now to do this, all we have to do is basically, right, what this would mean for this to be true is basically saying that like, um, you know, the sequence itself stays within a band that's of width epsilon, right? Because um, the sequence sort of asymptotically stays between, it doesn't literally stay between um, lim sup and lim inf but it's asymptotically staying between those two values, kind of. Uh, so this is sort of saying that there's this range of epsilon, uh, epsilon wide range that the sequence is asymptotically staying inside. And so it becomes clear from that mental picture that if we want to get this to be true, um, then we should uh, use the Cauchy criterion to make all the terms in the sequence be within epsilon from each other. So um, let's see, let epsilon greater than zero. Then there exists a capital N. So we're just gonna invoke the Cauchy criterion um, such that Sn minus Sm is less than epsilon for all greater than capital N, right? Okay, so now what we can say is that, let's see, so right, if we fix little m, sure, it doesn't even matter what, uh, what value to take. So um, fix little m. So for, for example, we could take little m equals n plus one, but I'm just going to leave it as little m. That's what the book does. Uh, so for consistency, 
But uh, yeah, we'll pretend little m is basically a constant. Um, then, so Sn is less than or equal to, or less than Sm plus epsilon for all n. Remember, m, m here is basically fixed, right? Uh, then, so V n is less than or equal to um, Sm plus epsilon, right? Uh, right, yes, because, um, well, this was true for all n, right? So, but that means that, okay, right? So Vn, remember, that's the supremum of all the values Sn for little n bigger than capital N, okay? Uh, so we're just saying because this is an upper bound uh, here, then um, then the, the least upper bound, Vn is the least upper bound on all of these values, has to be less than or equal to this, okay? Now, here's where the kind of tricky, a tricky thing happens, okay? Now we're gonna go back to thinking of little m as being a variable. So this is true. So actually, sorry, I was wrong when I said this before. We're not actually just fixing a specific value. We're, we're sort of fixing M, but we're not picking a specific value. We're just pretending that it stays constant, okay? And then we make this argument. So we only, here, this is only true for, well, I mean, it's true for all pairs, but, but we're considering little n to be varying and little m to be constant, right? So, uh, but, but now the argument we just made, right? This is true for all little m, right? Because we didn't actually pick a specific value. We just said, whatever value you want, just, you know, pick a value and, and, and keep it there, right? But it could be anything. So this whole argument is true for any value of m, even though we kind of pretended that it was fixed while we were making it, right? So, right. So what that means is that if you subtract epsilon from both sides of this, so um, Vn minus epsilon is a lower bound for the set of Sn with n bigger than, or rather maybe uh, it's less confusing if I make this, um, right? So if we now look at this inequality and say, this is actually true for every little m, and if you subtract epsilon to the other side, you get Vn minus epsilon is less than or equal to Sm for all m, right? So, um, so that means that Vn is less than or equal to un, or sorry, Vn minus epsilon. Vn minus epsilon is less than or equal to un. Uh, because un is the greatest lower bound on this set, okay? So vn is less than or equal to un plus epsilon. Now this means since uh, the limb sup, right? Remember vn is decreasing and un is increasing the limb sup Sn is less than or equal to Vn, less than or equal to Un plus epsilon, less than or equal to limb inf Sn plus epsilon, right? Uh, so that's the inequality we wanted to show. So now we can just say epsilon was arbitrary. So um, limb sub Sn is less than or equal to limb inf Sn. And because we know that limb inf is already less than or equal to the limb sub, they actually have to be equal to each other. And that says that Sn converges by the uh, lemma that we proved before, or the theorem actually, earlier theorem. 
So I, sorry for uh, this, you know, it was a little bit, maybe not, not perfectly well organized, but, and, and this argument is a little bit strange, maybe to, and it may be hard to get your head around. Um, I'm sure if you just, you know, think carefully enough about it, it will make sense. Um, but yeah, anyway, so that's, that's it for this lecture. Uh, see you guys next time.